flags are flying, the drums are beating, bayonets are fixed as the 33rd New Jersey prepares to leave for the scene of war. With the added incentive of other Union regiments surrounding it at gunpoint to make sure no one deserts, how did the 33rd recover its lost reputation? We'll find out when we return on Civil War Talk Radio. On Sound Authors, you can expect the unexpected. Kent Gustafson, Ph.D., author, publisher, professional musician, and now talk radio show host, will not only entertain you, but with new books and guest authors from around the world, will interview talented, independent musicians showcasing their fresh new music. Plan to join Dr. Kent and friends each Friday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, on World Talk Radio Studio A. Sound Authors, where authors sound off. Once upon a time, there lived three energy hogs. Now, an energy hog is what you have when humans waste energy. One day, the three energy hogs set out to find themselves a cottage. Let's look for leaky windows, said the first energy hog, for he knew that would waste energy. Let's look for leaky doors, said the second. Let's look for a swing set, said the third, for he had more blubber than brains. So they set off down the road. Presently, they came upon a tiny cottage where dwelled a clever girl named Dreadylocks. I hope it has leaky windows, cried the first energy hog. I hope it has leaky doors cried the second. I hope it has a bathroom, cried the third, for only his brains were smaller than his bladder. But Dreadilocks liked playing cool games at energyhog.org. And from energyhog.org, she learned how to use energy wisely. So the three energy hogs were forced to look elsewhere to waste energy and had to use the disgusting restroom at the gas station down the road. And the moral of the story is, to use energy wisely, log on to energyhog.org or waste not, hog not. This public service message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. World Talk Radio, bringing the world to you. Welcome back to Civil War Talk Radio. I'm Jerry Prokopovich, talking today with John G. Zinn, author of The Mutinous Regiment, the 33rd New Jersey in the Civil War. We started talking in our first segment about this unit organized in the summer of 1863. Not a good time to be looking for soldiers. The draft riots in New York City show the increasing northern disaffection with the war, uh, and uh, as a result, only the payment of enormous bounties was successful in bringing soldiers into the regiment. But as we heard, uh, they didn't stay, and uh, hundreds deserted before the regiment had even left Newark, New Jersey, where it was organized. And when we left at the end of the first segment, there was the regiment uh, dockside ready to board ships and go to the seat of war, yet surrounded by troops from Vermont and other uh, Union soldiers to make sure the rest of the regiment didn't sneak off and uh, jump the bounty and try to re-enlist somewhere else or just go home. So, John, you've got these these, uh, fellows ready to leave for, for war, but... Uh, their troubles weren't over. It wasn't just the, the the bounty jumping. There was somebody got killed. I think. Actually, there were. Well, it's, it may be connected to the bounty jumping, but there were two um, two bad incidents. One, the night before they left Newark, where a large number of them tried to run the guard, and uh, the members of the Third Vermont opened fire, and two members of the Regiment Thirty Third are killed in that exercise. And then the next day, on the they they go to the dock with the idea that they're leaving that afternoon. And they end up spending two days on the dock before they're finally moved off. And some of them had alcohol, some of them had it smuggled into them, and more incidents break out. And two more uh, members of the 30, uh, two more people anyway, are killed in incidents on the hospital dock. So uh, it's really not a good, you know, not a good situation by the time they're leaving New Jersey. Um, you know, we read a lot of places about how Civil War regiments left home having to live up to their reputation. The 33rd was in the unique position that they had to live theirs down. So, yeah, there, there's, <clears throat> we're not looking for great things from these, these these people at this point. Where do they go once they finally get on the boat? They go by boat to Washington, D.C., and then they start marching into Virginia, and they end up being attached to the 11th Corps. Um, but they're only in Virginia for a couple of weeks because shortly after that, or shortly at that time, is the Battle of Chickamauga, and after the Union defeat and the retreat into Chattanooga, 
um, the 11th and 12th Corps are sent to um, to Tennessee, and the 33rd, being part of the 11th Corps, immediately makes that train uh, that five-day train uh, trip to the west. So they become, uh, as you said in the opening segment, uh, one of the very few New Jersey regiments to serve in the West. And I thought this was very interesting. Uh, one of the first things I wrote many years ago as an undergraduate was a, a thesis on the interactions between North, uh, soldiers within the Union armies from the East and the West. Uh, and you had things like the, the Iron Brigade in the Army of the Potomac coming from the West, but then you had troops, uh, as the ones we're talking about here, uh, in the 11th Corps, 12th Corps, going uh, out west. And most of them weren't from New Jersey, so this must have been a, a culture shock for the, for the New Jersey men to, uh, to j- just to go west, much less to go south. I think very much so, because um, even the ones that were from the rural parts of New Jersey weren't prepared for... Um, the rural parts of Tennessee and Alabama, where they first ended up, and then and then basically walking home from Chattanooga by way of uh, Atlanta and Savannah. You know, the, the, and even the train ride itself. Um, I mean, these last few days uh, here in, in spring of 2008, there's been a lot of stories of uh, uh, several airlines have taken hundreds of planes out of service, and there have been travelers stranded. And I guess in uh, in London, they have a new terminal that's not working, and people have been stranded overnight. Uh, we we complain if we're stranded overnight traveling somewhere, but the train journey uh, to get across the the country that the 33rd New Jersey took I thought was uh, was pretty harrowing. It had to have been, um, and there are some of the accounts talk about how. Uh, they had to use two engines to push the trains up to the uh, heights of certain mountains and uh, uh, the damage that the troops did to some of the... You can imagine what kind of cars they were riding in. I mean, they weren't, you know, uh, deluxe passenger cars. Uh, that The damage they did to those. The remarkable thing is how quickly the journey passed. Um, what I've read is that when the, the idea was first proposed... Uh, Stanton said that they could move the troops in five days, and uh, Lincoln said it would take five days just to get them all in Was- to Washington. And they did, in fact, move them to- in five days. And uh, according to Shelby Foote, it was the fastest movement of troops uh, in history to go that far a distance. For for that for that larger group to go that long a distance, right? Uh, I, I think that without knowing, uh, uh, I, that sounds reasonable to me. It certainly was a remarkable uh, transfer. So they make it out there, and now you've got these uh, uh, these Eastern troops, these Army of the Potomac troops. Who, well, they're not really identified with the Army of the Potomac. I guess they're still raw. They haven't fought yet. They haven't, haven't done much of anything. Uh, so, so what's their what's their baptism like? What what what's the first campaign that they? Part- they are involved in the um, the battle for the battles for Chattanooga. Um, on the first day of Chattanooga at Sitico Creek, they're in, engaged for the first time. And they do suffer their first casualties at that point. They're only marginally involved. What hap- they're only marginally involved in the Battle of Chattanooga. What happens after, which is kind of more typical of their experience, um, before Sitico Creek, they're told to leave their knapsacks behind with the idea that they're going to recover them after the fight. They don't see their knapsacks for three and a half weeks because after Chattanooga, they become part of the Union force that Grant sends, Grant sends north to relieve Knoxville. And so they spent three weeks on the march without tents, um, without blankets, uh, in fortunately not cold, but very wet weather. Uh, so, and that's kind of typical of what their experience is in the rest of the war. There's a, there's a piece in um, uh, Patty Griffith's book, uh, Battle Tactics of the Civil War, which I think was reprinted under the title Rally Once Again, uh, in, maybe the other way around. But he uh, is a British uh, military author. You suggest you could do an entire article or even a, a book on uh, the concept of putting down the packs, that whenever a regiment was told to put down their packs, they knew there was something big ahead. Right, exactly. Uh, because you didn't do that lightly. Uh, right. These guys lost their stuff for three weeks, and uh, it meant you were you were going into combat. Exactly. You want to carry all that extra equipment. So, so they lose their gear, but they... Uh, uh, but they survived. So, so let's take us through this this campaign a little further. Well, the um, the, the march to Knoxville is to relieve uh, Burnside, who was being besieged by Longstreet. The siege is actually raised bef- 
before um, before they get there, and so at least they don't have to march all that way. But then they turn around and march back in increasingly worse weather, just torrential downpours, and they're you know they're marching in mud and sleeping in mud and uh, fairly miserable experience. They get back to um, Lookout Mountain, Lookout Valley, um, right before Christmas. And then they'll spend winter quarters in Lookout Valley, which is of the two winters they spend in, they're in the war, the only winter quarters that they enjoy. And up to this point, they have they haven't seen any serious combat, is that right? Not really. They've just had the one skirmish at Sitico Creek. That's the only combat they've seen. But they have suffered casualties. They suffered a few casualties at Sitico Creek. They also suffered some some um, from uh, artillery fire on the final day at Chattanooga, and you know, like any like any Civil War regiment, they suffer losses from disease, and especially after they return from that march, there's a number of the men that die of typhoid fever in early January, who obviously were in weakened condition after all that exposure to the elements. You write quite a bit about the, the uh, well, just by listing the names uh, as we go through. The, uh, the the regiment's experience. You have a lot of very interesting photographs of members of the regiment, and then uh, periodically you'll mention uh, you know who died this month or this week, and it, it really does stand out when you when you look at them as individuals and not just statistics. How how devastating disease was for this regiment, and I think that's fairly typical. Disease would killed far more, I think, than uh, you know than, than combat did, and. Uh, one of the things that I really tried, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned in by name in the book every soldier in the 33rd who died for whatever reason. And so I tried to be very diligent about doing that. Well, it, it produces a, I think it's an effective device uh, without, uh, oh, you know, over-dramatizing the fact. It does point out that these are individuals and there are families at home in New Jersey waiting to hear from them. Uh, which brings up another thing that you talk quite a bit about, which is the, the mail uh, between between home front and, and the war. Yeah, well, yes, I mean, um, I was a, uh, I mean, I was I was in Vietnam, and I remember what how important it was to me to get letters from home, and that was something that I don't think has ever been different. I mean, soldiers really value getting mail, and uh, it was a priority, uh, from what I've read, a priority for the Union Army that they move mail as quickly as they as they could. I think in one source I read that a a letter could move from New Jersey to Tennessee in those days about the same time it takes today. And if you read the letters of soldiers or even newspaper articles written by officers from the 33rd, they're always talking to people back home about how important the mail is. And, of course, this is also one of our main historical sources, is reading the letters from the soldiers back to the home front. Absolutely, and in fact, as the story of the 33rd gets uh, moves forward, that's what becomes difficult about the march to the sea and the Carolina campaign because they they were out of touch with the North, they weren't able to write letters, and so there's very little eyewitness material from the 33rd for those two time periods. But when it's there, uh, it, it's it's very interesting. You mentioned, uh, for example, there was one uh, an officer who wrote under a pen name. Uh, I. Uh, uh, yes, uh, um, under the name Miles Alienus or Alinus or something like that, right. meaning, meaning I think that he was miles away from home. He was well, killed at um, at Sitico Creek, so that didn't last very long. But uh, th- that was another – in newspapers in New Jersey and I'm sure in most places were obviously not able to have war correspondence, so they relied upon officers – and other people to write them letters, and that's and and that's really it's really a good source. Of course, some the, you know the, they wrote those letters knowing that they were going to be published, and so they're probably a little more careful as to what they write. And they would use these pen names, of course, because if they're writing about people in their own regiment exactly. or their own officers, their own commanders, they they wouldn't want to be very diplomatic about what they're, you're being said. They have to be. I my my Latin is not good, but I think Miles pronounced the Latin way, is, is the word for soldier. Okay. So that would make him uh, Miles Alienus, the, the soldier, foreign soldier or stranger soldier, mm. um, or soldier away from home, uh, all of which would apply. Okay. Um, but uh, but also the double entendre, you point out he is miles away from home right. uh, as well. So that's uh, th- these were classically educated men we're talking about in some cases. Some of them certainly were. Uh, well, we know that literacy levels among Civil War soldiers were very high. So that's another reason why the um, car, you know, the correspondence was uh, the letters were so important. They were, and and again, and the fact that this one particular officer with the pen name was then 
killed, as you point out, really adds to the, the poignancy of it. Now, the the, the soldiers uh, return from, uh, they, they go into winter quarters in 1863. In 1864, they embark on the Atlantic campaign. And Correct. Our, our listeners know of uh, Sherman's struggle to fight Joe Johnston in the, the North Georgia mountains, repeatedly trying to outflank them. Uh, what was the New Jersey, uh, 33rd New Jersey's experience in that campaign? Well, they were fairly heavily involved. They were engaged in every major battle in that campaign other than Kennesaw Mountain. The first um, flanking attempt that you referred to was at Rocky Face Ridge, and they were part of the force that tried to keep the Confederates occupied while uh, McPherson's army um, outflanked the Confederates. So at Dug Gap, which is one of the high point uh, uh, high points of the mountain, um, they were part of the main force attacking, and they suffered some uh, some ca- casualties there. The second major battle is Rosaka, and again they're engaged while somebody else is trying to outflank um, outflank the uh, Confederate army. At Rosaka, they get bogged down in this battle where I think ultimately there are ten Union regiments. Um, that are just a stalemate with uh, some Confederate troops around some cannon, and it just goes on and on until the Confederates finally withdraw. So that those first two major campaigns, they're involved, uh, they're, uh, battles rather, they're heavily involved. And then, uh, th- then they come to their worst uh, engagement of the war, uh, as I recall. Well, they, they, there are then a couple more battles after that. I mean, there is um, New Hope Church uh, where they... They were somewhat engaged there. Actually, um, to the uh, Kennesaw Mountain, they are not engaged, but there is a, uh, a smaller battle at Pine Knob, which is near Kennesaw Mountain. Um, the 33rd suffers the highest uh, casualties of any Union regiment engaged at uh, Pine Knob. But the, what I think what you're referring to is um, the Battle of Peachtree Creek which is July 20th, um, and that is after uh, Hood replaces Johnston as in command of the Confederate uh, forces, and he's been given the charge of not being on the defensive but attacking. And the 33rd is unfortunate enough to have been given the assignment to be out in front of the Union lines preparing a hill for a uh, a battery when uh, the Confederate attack is launched, and twofold of the Confederate divisions um, fall upon the position occupied by the 33rd, one that they hadn't even prepared to defend. Now, that's a very dramatic moment, and that, that does stand out. That there's this poor regiment on this hill uh, just sort of tossed out ahead to, to get some ground ready, and suddenly the entire Confederate attack sweeps over them. Uh, so they are driven back. Is that the? Do they lose their colors in that fight? They lose their state battle flag in that flight. In that fight, that's correct. So uh, that that, uh, as you point out, that's one of the worst things in terms of morale that can happen to a regiment. Uh, Absolutely. Now, General Hooker and other generals assured them that there was no disgrace based on those conditions. Uh, that he was surprised that anybody got away. Um, but obviously, it's still not a. It's not a good thing. Yeah, so that was that was a, a, a difficult struggle. They lose uh, uh, they lose prisoners in these battles as well as uh, men killed and wounded. Then they especially a lot of prisoners uh, suffer a lot of prisoners taken captive at Peachtree Creek. Some thirty are missing after that battle, and a number of them are prisoners, and they end up in uh, in Andersonville. Well, this is a good place for us to take another. Uh, intermission to come back uh, as the the regiment will march uh, on to Atlanta and then on to the uh, relief eventually of of at least one prison, former prison camp. So we'll stop here for just a moment. We're talking with John Zinn, author of The Mutinous Regiment, the 33rd New Jersey in the Civil War. I'm Jerry Prokopovich, and we'll be right back on Civil War Talk Radio. (laughs) 